at some point in your genealogy research journey, you're going to have to be tackling brick walls by looking at death records. And death records have a lot of clues that are waiting for you. If you're lucky, you'll find the answer to the questions that you're trying to solve. The full names of your ancestors' parents and where they were born, the full names of their spouses, and information about their children. Death records can help you chip away that, that brick wall. So let's start diving in and discussing what type of records are we looking at? But first, if this is your first time here, my name is Devin Noel Lee, and this is Family History Fanatics, where we love to help you understand your DNA, climb your family tree, and write your ancestors' stories along the way. Be sure you become very familiar with the description box of the videos on this channel. We have a freebie that you'll want to pick up if you haven't already, the Brick Wall Busting Guides for tips and tricks on how to tackle your brick walls with more stress and less help, hair pulling. Now this is a third in a multi-part series on how I discovered uh, who, the identity of my fourth great grandfather, John Townley's, his parents. In order to do that, I had to develop a genealogy research plan. And in that research plan, I had the primary goal of figuring out his parents, but I had a number of subset, secondary um, sub goals, if you will, that will help me get to that ultimate goal. So I'm actually going to start with death records. And the, one of the reasons why I'm going to start with death records is got to research them at some point, right? Now, my friends over at Find My Past said that it's often best to work backwards in time, starting with the most recent events that happened towards our lifetime and work backwards. So from death to birth is actually a solid uh, research methodology plan to try to tackle any of your research qual questions, especially your brick walls ones. So death records are used to validate deaths as well as give you clues to other information. They are among some of the easiest records to find and access online, particularly when there are cemetery record websites such as Find a Grave and Billion Grave. There might be others and I invite you to share your knowledge in the comments section below of other cemetery record websites that we want to explore. Now, I want some quick wins, so let's start diving into death records. Now, there are a variety of death records to help you to validate the death of your ancestors, and depending on the time and place that you're researching, you will have access to those types. So, as we said before, death certificates are very helpful. Then you also have some death registers. Now, in Canada, you have an entry that looks like a certificate, I mean, like it, it it's it's boxed in such a way it's not like a register, but it's still in a form register. I'm not entirely sure what you call them, but they do stand out differently between a death certificate and what I like to call the death register, where one line goes to one person and you can have 40 or so pe people on a page. So that's kind of a death register. Now, there are church funeral records. Find My Past has Catholic funeral records available for some places in the United States. I did have access to some Catholic funeral records that were from um, Columbus, Ohio, when I was researching my ancestor, Joseph Geisler. So church records are very, very useful. As I mentioned before, cemeteries, gravestones, grave markers, mausoleum markers are also pretty handy. But I really like internment records. Internment records or tell you where someone is buried, who bought the plot, and other details that give you clues to the past. So if you can get an internment record, you really, really like them. Something similar to a cemetery record is the plot information. I know that there were several people buried in um, Greenlawn Cemetery for the Longs my long family <laughs> and I didn't know how everybody was related until I saw the plat map and I identified everybody and their relationship to the owner and that was really handy. So you definitely want to dive into that. But you can also find funeral programs. Funeral programs can help you um, know a lot of information but they're not always easy to find and they're usually in home sources in a box in an attic we haven't looked at in a very long time. So did I miss any? let me know. I want to learn and I want to know what you've used successfully. 
So now we talked about theory, it's time to dive into application. We're gonna start exploring the records that John Townley had, starting with the death entry. So we're gonna start where I started many moons ago. At the time when I was researching John Townley, this is as far as I could get. I could just get to the index for his record. But there's a lot of information we can see on his death index. We can see that we can see a death date. We can do a death place. We can see an age. And from that age, we can extrapolate the year he was born. Now, this record tells me he was in um, New Jersey and that he was buried in Spring Grove Cemetery. Now, Spring Grove is something that I recognize because that is where Richard Townley, remember I said that Richard Townley is the ancestor I am descended from? So when you're working on your genealogy, you go from generation to generation to generation so that when you see certain clues like, oh, Spring Grove Cemetery, it helps you know I've got the right family. Now there is a father's name and we, we're done, right? Brick wall solved. His name is Effingham. We just go and be done, right? Well, not so much. It's time to start evaluating the records. And I have a video on this channel about how to evaluate records. And then I actually have one that's targeted on how to evaluate death records because not all information on a death record is created equal. I also want you to know about a really cool quick video from my friend Helen Tovey from Family Tree Magazine UK. She talks about the valuable information that you can find in death records. All of this information is in the show notes and you'll find the show notes in the link in the description. So here we are on the Hamilton County death records and I have found John Townley. Now the headers are up here, the name in full, death date, place of death, um, single and married, age, place of birth, occupation, names of parents, father and mother, the disease, the cause of death, um, indirect cause of death. So it has lots of opportunities to tell us about how they died, their color, and their last known residence. So here we are with John, and we know that when he died, and he died the 7th of October, uh, excuse me, the 7th of August, 1890. And he died in Cincinnati, Hamilton County, Ohio. Not a huge fan of all of these tally marks. <laughs> um, he is was married and um, he was 89. So we can use that to calculate his birth year, but not necessarily month and day because we don't have all that information filled out. It would have been great if they um, put zero, zero, because then we can know he died on the day he was born. That would have been cool. All they gave us was New Jersey. Dang it, that would have been nice if they gave us a little bit, put New Jersey over here and then a place right here, but nope, no set list luck. We do have that Effingham, as I said before. He died of general disability. That's a nice little information. And 82 Van Horn. Now, one of the reasons we don't just stop at the index like this and we go to the records that I just showed you is because there are clues that we use to continue research and to know that we're using the right ancestor. We're looking at the right ancestor. And when I saw Van Horn, Van Horn is a location that Richard Townley, my third great grandfather, John's son, that address appears with him often. And that's how you know, okay, this, this record is at least partially accurate and pertains to my ancestor. So in the dis comments, tell me which bits of information are the most reliable. I want to make sure that you know what I know and we're all on the same page. Now there is a debate other whether I looked at an original record or not if this digital image is sufficient to say I looked at an original record. For most of us, it's good enough. There are some instances when you actually need to go look at the record because there's some information that was written in pencil or associated with the file that didn't come through in digitizing. If Tell me what side of the fence you are on. Would you consider this an original record or would you say, no, it's digital and you really need to actually go to the actual record. This was just temporary to research while we're home. I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. 
Now, as I said before, this is my ancestor and I have a video that can help you be able to make the same uh, conclusions that I did. So be sure to check out that video at some time in the near future. So now I need to go update my research plan with the information I found from John Tantley. One of the hacks that I have for making your research notes and speeding up the process is to copy the information from the extracted record, control C, then come over to your research plan. So I'm gonna put um, death record, I'll come back for something in the middle, and I'm gonna control V that information. Now, it's not perfect, so I'm gonna have to clean it up. Give me a minute to clean it up. So now that I've cleaned everything up, I wanna capture a few more of those details. 82 Van Horn was his residence. So I'm gonna go grab my source citation. So I'm gonna come back to the county record. I'm gonna scroll down on family search and then I'm gonna have this drop document information in a drop down. If I keep scrolling, it says citing this record. I'm gonna highlight and copy and I'm going to highlight the record, insert footnote, control B, there you go. Now, before we continue with the um, process of evaluating death records in an actual case study, I want to invite you to be participate in the um, FHF Extra Channel membership. We actually can go deeper into some of our, your genealogy research questions for DNA writing and research, as well as give you bonus training from um, webinars and conferences that we attend, as well as our deep archive with videos from inter experts, as well as other videos that we only reserve for channel members. So be sure to check that out. So now we're going to go and evaluate the gravestone of John Townley that I found in the Spring Grove Cemetery because I had that clue. I knew where to look now, Spring Grove Cemetery. Now, if you have not used Find a Grave before, you'll definitely want to watch my video on how to evaluate the information you find on Find a Grave. Not all of it is as strong evidence as you think it might be, but it definitely is de um, clues that you can use for any of your genealogy research. But what I really love about find a grave are the pictures of the gravestones. So let's go over to find a grave, see what information I can find out about John Chantley. So I really love this grave stone. I clicked on the image. I'm going to go look at the view of the original images and you can see, oh, it's a very tall monument. There's a second photo we can show in a moment. Born October 1st, 1801, died August 7th, 1890. Eveline is his wife and her death gate. So what can I take from the gravestone and put into my research? Well, this is evidence of his relationship to his wife. Remember, I do want to validate his relationship to his wife and his other children. So that's part of researching him. And I can get that off the stone because it's written in stone. <laughs> the birth dates and death dates are not the smoking gun you definitely want to keep looking for additional information but i do have information about his specific death date and his specific birth date so that's very handy the rest of the information that you do see on um find a grave is actually contributor information so i can always use this as clues but the best information on find a grave is actually going to be the stones and how people are related so i need to go back and update my research plan for the sake of this training i don't want to make these videos super duper long but i'm going to go ahead and go to the next um, resource that i want to share with you if you're lucky you're going to have cemetery records and cemetery records that are easy to find i found this interment record for john townley and what i really like about it so let me get my pointer is that this is where the information from new jersey is coming from so we've got new jersey on the death register we had new jersey on find a grave but remember it's just user contributed information it wasn't on the stone and now we have this interment record that says New Jersey. Now, some researchers will tell you, well, it's really all the same source, but it's pointing to New Jersey. And for the purposes of this exercise, I'm going to keep using that as a clue that he's from New Jersey somewhere. 
Uh, his last place of residence in Cincinnati, we knew that. These pieces of information were already on his stone. That is on his death record. And we have the parents. The lot owner is John Townley. So he is buried in his own plot. And that will be shown a little bit later in, um, in the process. We also said that this is ordered by John, I mean, R John's son, Richard. So it's entirely possible that Richard knows this information about his father, but he would know this this information about his birth secondhand, and he would likely know this information firsthand. Now, going back to find a grave, one of the fantastic things about find a grave is not just the stones, but the fact that you can trace the children because they're all linked together. The one thing I really like on Find a Grave is being able to compare the plot numbers. So I'm going to look at Garden, L. Ain, Section, Lot, and Space. So when I click on that and I click on Evelyn, I already know that she's going to be there because her name's in this stone, Space 7. Well, I can go through and I can also click on Eliza Townley. Where was she born? Section 100, lot 60, space 10. All right, what about her brother, Asa Townley? Section 100, lot 60, space 10. So on and on and on, I can go through and I can see all of this information about where they were born. So I'm actually gonna go to my research plan. Now using find a grave alone, I was able to piece together who was buried in the same plot as John Tunley. So here is section 100, lot 60, and space one is Asa, his oldest son. Here's John in lot uh, four and his wife in lot seven. I mean, excuse me, I've been saying lot and I mean space. In space three is his daughter-in-law, Anna Townsley who is the wife of Richard, my direct ancestor. And then Asa's wife is in lot eight, space eight. And then John's daughter Eliza is in space 10. And Eliza's daughter Ophelia is in 13. And I'm not sure who is in these other spaces. I'm gonna have to do some more digging. Now in Spring Grove Cemetery, I can go to locate a lo loved one. And this is actually a pretty cool website. I think many people would really like using this. So I'm gonna look for John Townley and click search and look for 1-1-1890. So he was in 1890. So there's actually several views. I can actually really zoom in quite far. And what I really like is that other plot occupants. Now, this was where I was able to really make some headway. So I didn't have Emery on my list, but here they tell me section 100, lot 60, space 17. So then I can go ahead and put that back here onto my table. And notice I have to add more rows because that's lot um, 17. So I'm gonna go ahead and update my um, chart based on the information that I found in Spring Grove. So now my chart is updated based on that information that I had and I color coded based on family line. So green would be Richard, the ancestor, the, the third great, uh, third great grandfather, the son of John that I'm related to. John and Evelyn are brown. Um, Asa and his wife are blue. And then all of the pink is because this is all through John's daughter, Eliza, who married the Woodruffs and the Woodruffs and the Childs had several, took up several of this spot. So it's a 20 person um, plot and I really like that information. Now, one more thing I'm gonna do just because of who I am, I'm going to color code or regroup based on the family. So it's gonna go out of um, plot a space number order and it's going to go into this order right here so you can see the family structure is a little bit clearer. I kind of like that. 
Now, all of this information is over in my research plan template, and eventually it can turn into my research report. So make sure you're utilizing that. So then now that we have looked at a number of the death records for John Tanley, have we proven um, what his death date and place is? Well, I am confident that I have established when he died, where he died, and where he was buried. The other information that I found, such as the name of his father, is still just a clue. I've added all of that information to my research plan, and now it's time to tackle the next step. So if you were me, what would you research next? I would love to know. Do you know what I keep telling you to go to the comments section? Because this is a training together experience, and I hope you find a lot of value by communicating in the comments section. So where should I... Um, research next or where would you research next in this quest to try to open up the brick wall of your ancestor. To continue watching the videos in this series, make sure you check the playlist here. And if you've already watched all of those, then be sure to check out this video, which has been specifically selected for your research needs.